But if you would, go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 17. We're going to look there in just a second. Acts chapter 17. As we close out this lesson, I just want to look out. Look at some of the things that we can do as individuals. How can I improve evangelism? I know it's something that we typically get so scared about doing, oh, talking to other people, but, but let's just back up a second. Look at Paul and what he did. What was the tool that he utilized when he was trying to convert with people? In Acts chapter 17, verses 2 through 3, I'm not actually going to start in verse 1. Acts chapter 17, beginning in verse 1. It says, now when they had passed through Amphilus and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, and saying, this Jesus who I proclaim to you is the Christ. And notice that this was a tendency that Paul had. On his, on his missionary journeys, you can trace the steps of Paul. Whenever he would get to a new city, we see that he had a custom, as this verse says. He had a custom, he had a practice, a habit that he would do, and that he would go to the synagogue, he'd start with the religious people, but notice what he would do when he got there. It's something that is repeated throughout the book of Acts, that not just that he went to the synagogue, that's important, but that he would reason with people. He would reason with them. The Greek word for reason or reasoning appears 13 times in the New Testament. And in 10 of those instances, it is being ascribed to the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts and what he was doing and how he would communicate with people. That he would reason with them. And it was a tool that Paul utilized. And I believe in, what, in part of what made him such an effective and a successful evangelist of the kingdom. Because we think about what reasoning is. If you're going to reason with someone, that's defined as this, to argue, to make a speech, to converse, or to discuss. And that first part of that definition, to argue, that probably brings negative connotations to mind, right? Like, like two kids that are bickering and arguing back and forth. That's not the reasoning that Paul was engaged in. He's trying to make logical connections, trying to help people to connect the dots as he's trying to persuade them about who Jesus is and why they need to change their life as a result. And it's interesting in all those instances that are on the screen right now, when we see Paul going to the synagogue and reasoning with people, who is he reasoning with? Well, it would be the Jews, because the Jews would be the ones that were in the synagogues. And so this was a tactic, this was a tool that he would use to interact and to communicate effectively with them. But I think it's vitally important that we see from a passage like Acts 17 and verse 2. That not just that Paul went to the synagogue. Not just even that, that, he, that he would reason with people. But notice what was he reasoning about? He was reasoning with them from the scriptures. From the word of God. That's what he was reasoning with them about. That was the basis of his argument and what he was trying to present to them. He wasn't discussing opinion. He wasn't expressing uh, tradition or the way, well, I've always understood it as. No. He was reasoning with them from the scriptures. And why that is so important for us today. Brethren, we're, we're living in what we could maybe classify as a postmodernist society. The idea that truth is subjective. Truth is relative. Truth is something that's just going to vary from person to person. There's no real standard for what truth is. And if we're trying to discuss Bible things and spiritual things with other people, but we're not really using the Bible, that's only going to fuel that mentality. That's only going to fuel that idea that, well, maybe how you see it and how I see it can both be right. And that's why we need to be very careful that we reason with people from the Scriptures, that we can't buy into that fallacy, holding up God's Word as the standard. And so what I mean by this, when we're trying to reason, and reasoning like Paul, and as we finish, we're going to look at three different ways that, that we can reason like Paul in our own lives and how we can implement this. But I want you to think about a persuasive speech. Have you ever done one of those? Think back to maybe your schooling days in college. If you took any type of communications class, you're going to have to present a persuasive speech. When I was in college, I had to do a persuasive speech, and 
what I tried to persuade the class on, we had to use common objects is what the teacher challenged us with. And so my common object that I chose was Febreze. And I was trying to convince the class that Febreze was a cheaper and better alternative than doing laundry. <laughs> and I'll tell you right now, I wasn't successful, but I enjoyed it. I had a good time trying to make these arguments. And what I was doing is I'm trying to sell this in any way that I can. I'm trying to make every argument of why Febreze is better and money talks the college students. So that was my main argument. And I would go to all these desperate lanes. And we see this all the time today, that people use persuasive tactics in trying to talk with other people. If you've ever met, maybe you have some family, maybe you have some friends, maybe you are uh, vegan or gluten-free. You come across those individuals and they instantly try and sell you on it. They, and they, they talk about all the benefits that this will have for your life. And you know what? They're probably right. You would think about, have you ever met an Alabama football fan? If you try and talk about how your football team is better, they will persuade. They will convince you why Alabama is the better team. Or these door-to-door -door salesmen that have been so common in Utah since we've moved here. We've had like five come to the house trying to sell us that solar is the way of the future. Buy in the solar now. Get it on your house. You're going to save money. And so we, we see this persuasion happening in all these different aspects of buy. Is that not something that we can utilize as evangelists for the kingdom of God? Because when it comes to the gospel and to the kingdom, we are reasoning with people with an aim to persuade them. Persuade them that Jesus is the way. And we need to seek and create these opportunities to persuade people about the gospel. And I want to read uh, just a few verses from Acts chapter 21, verses 40 through chapter 22 and verse 5. This was the scripture reading this morning that Randy read. I just want to read beginning in verse 40 through verse 2, the start. In verse 40, it says, And when he had given him permission, Paul, standing on the steps, motioned with his hands to the people, and there was a great hush. He addressed them in the Hebrew language, saying, and we'll pause there for a second. The common language at that time was what? It would have been Greek. But Paul understood that as he's having this chance to basically defend himself and his ministry and what he's been involved in, he's speaking to a crowd of angry, angry Jewish people. And so Greek probably wouldn't have been an effective language to address them in. And so what he does is he addresses them in the Hebrew language. And so he appeals to them in their native tongue. And notice the result. In verse 1 where he says, brothers and fathers, which would have been a very complimentary way of addressing them. He says, hear the defense that I now make them. Verse 2, and when they heard that he was addressing them in the Hebrew language, they became even more quiet. So they, they were kind of listening to him, but not really. But all of a sudden, once they heard him speaking in their own tongue, a great hush fell over them. Oh, okay, well, we'll hear what this man has to say. And so what can we learn from that? What well, what is the equivalent of us speaking in the common language? Please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying to change our whole manner of speech, change the way that we talk, to just kind of fit in with those around us. That, that's not what my point is at all. But what I am trying to say is, what good does the message of salvation do if we can't present it to people in a clear, plain, and understandable way? What good does that do? I think too often we can all be guilty, myself included, that sometimes when we talk to people outside of the church, our language is too busy that it's just weighed down. It's peppered with this language and this lingo that people have no idea what we are talking about. Even terms like Bible study, that may sound pretty self-explanatory, but to some people, they've never done a Bible study before. They have no idea what that looks like. You can say, turn to the Gospel of Mark, and they say, where is that? They don't know the check the front. They're looking for a page number. And so that can be something that is so uh, just confusing. Or we, we use words like the Gospel. A lot of people don't know what the Gospel is. We, we talk about the plan of salvation. We need to hear, believe, confess, repent, be baptized. We say that so fast, people think that's all one word. And we, we're guilty of using this type of speech with people. Is it understandable? Is it effective? Are we able to speak in the common language to those around us? I think we can easily be like Paul and make it our aim to just talk to people in an understandable way, a clear and plain way when we are presenting the word of God to them. 
Again, because what, what good does the powerful message of God's word do if we can't communicate to others in a way that they can understand it? But something else we learn from here at the beginning of Acts chapter 22, something else Paul did and how he reasoned with the crowd as a way to try and persuade them and get them to understand is we see that he compliments their zeal. Notice in verse 3 what he does. He says, as he kind of begins his speech, he says, I am a Jew born in Tarsus in Cilicia, brought up, but brought up in this city, educated at the feet of Gamaliel according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers, being zealous for God as all of you are this day. And so before Paul really gets to the heart of his defense, again, because he's essentially on trial here. He's trying to defend himself so he doesn't go to prison. Notice what he does. He's not in a rush to free himself and make sure he gets off free. He's going to compliment the crowd. He gains their attention. He praises them for their zeal, even though they are misguided, even though they didn't have all of the answers. He didn't rush right into, I'm right, you're wrong, here's why. That wouldn't have been effective at all. Theodore Roosevelt is known for saying, nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. And that's a mentality we need to carry into the conversations that we have with individuals, especially when we carry a Bible in our hands. If we carry that around as an authority to mistreat people and look down on them, that's not going to help our case at all. Paul did this again in Acts chapter 17 when he gives that sermon on Mars Hill. Remember that they had all those gods there. Athens, a city that was just known for having more gods than people. And they had that unknown God. And what does he do? He compliments them for being religious people. Even though they are totally misguided, totally off base, he uses that as a springboard to tell them about the true and living God. And maybe that's something that we can adopt to our own lives. That especially when we're beginning a dialogue or conversation with others, let's compliment and praise where we can. In our individual conversations, in our individual studies that we may have with other people, thank people for showing up. Thank them for their interest in spiritual things. Thank them for the comments that they make, the questions that they make, even if they are a little bit off the wall. Maybe if you didn't see it coming and you don't know how to answer it, thank them anyway for that. Let's praise where we can. And part of that's not just building rapport, but it's showing that we care. That we can't be in such a hurry to tell people that they're wrong, or else they're going to be in a real big hurry to leave. The last thing that we, see, that we see Paul doing in these first few verses of Acts chapter 22, verses 4 through 5, is he acknowledges his own failures. Notice in verses 4 and 5, Paul says, I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering to prison both men and women, as the high priest and the whole council of elders can bear me witness. From them I received letters to the brothers, and I journeyed toward Damascus to take, those, uh, to take those also who were there and bring them in bonds to Jerusalem to be punished. You know, no, nobody likes a know-it-all. Nobody does. That, that's not fun to be in a conversation with somebody that acts like they have all the answers, that they're the one that's right, and you are just totally wrong. And if we talk with others like that, that we're the only ones that have the truth, what good is that going to accomplish? We, we, I know, 1 Peter 3.15, we, we need to be able to make a defense of the hope and the faith that's within us. But if we leave off the last part of that verse, not doing it with gentleness and respect, we may have just compromised the first part of that verse. If we act like we're the only person that is right and we're perfect, Not only is that going to be discouraging, it's not going to be effective. It's going to stink of the Pharisees and that holier-than-thou impression that they gave off. And notice in verses 4 and 5 what Paul is saying here in Acts 22. That would not have been easy. As he's recalling his past, talking about the things that he's done. And he doesn't stop here. You could go through Acts 22, continue down to verse 20, and he even admits and confesses, Remember when Stephen was stoned to death and murdered? He talks about how he approved of that. That he had a part to play in what took place. He's not making himself vulnerable, though, to receive a pat on the back and say, Wow, Paul, look look at you. Look at how far you've come. I think the reason why Paul brings that up is to highlight the power of the gospel. 
He's showing how much God has done for him through even as he identifies himself the chief of sinners. That he uses his past to show the transformation that occurred through the gospel. And part of that transformation means a change needs to take place. Something that he's expecting those that he's talking to. A change that they will need to make if they wish to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. Even though the word never appears in Acts 22, what Paul does is he reasons with the crowd. And many other things could be pointed out from this chapter and the whole ministry of Paul. And what he does as an effective evangelist in talking and communicating with other people. And I hope we'll take these things to heart and look, to, look for ways to improve how we talk with people about the Bible. It's not something that we need a 12-week evangelism course on, a class on for all the answers that you're going to be asked. Yes, those things are helpful. They have their place. Sometimes we just need to get out there and do it. We need to create opportunities to talk with people, show them uh, not just that we care about them, but we care about the gospel. We care about their souls. I think probably one of my favorite parts of Acts 22 is that chapter was meant to be a defense of Paul where he's able to get out of going to prison and clear his name, and yet what it turns out to be is a chance for him to convert people, a chance for him to preach the gospel of Christ. And what an example that serves at us. And maybe we shouldn't always be sitting back waiting for opportunities. We need to be courageous. We need to create them, aiming to persuade others about the truth of Jesus. If you're here this morning and maybe you look at your own life, you've been studying on your own, you've come to know that a transformation is required in your own life, that a change needs to take place in the way that you've been living, to put off the old man of sin, to put that to death, and put on Christ in the waters of baptism, you have a chance to do so this morning. And so if you're here this morning, you're ready to become a child of God, now would be a convenient time to begin that walk. And so if you're here and subject to heaven's invitation anyway, we invite you to come to the front as we stand and sing the song.